Meow. Meow. We haven't had enough boot eating in these videos. Outside of when she invaded my keep video. So we get more Boo Kitty now. Right, Boo? She is so photogenic. Now, if only I got her to stop eating the fake fur that's on this little pedestal. It's ridiculous. I mean, she definitely loves this pedestal more than any of my other kitties. Which is weird, because this is actually owned by... Was owned by a friend of mine who lost their kitty and was giving away their kitty's things. I said I would take it, and, well, here it is. Works well. It's not like my other cats ignore it or anything, just... Not like Boo. So, I hope you're having a good kitten internet. I decided today I'm just going to play a bit of Endless Space 2 and explain what I'm doing because I'm playing with some mods and it might be interesting. So first off, I should explain what Endless Space 2 is. It is a 4X turn-based strategy game. So 4X games are expand, explore, extinguish, exterminate. I, I can't remember off the top of my head. I've said it before. But anyway, um, Endless Space 2 is my favorite space-based one. Um, it's, well, I'll explain as I go, but, so, for an idea, in Endless Space 2, there's a wide variety of factions. Um, you can play from anything from boring humans all the way up to bird samurai, to Roswell Greys, to Bill Gates, to... Mathematically Impossible Beings. Yep. So, this is a very interesting game, and I'm not going to play a huge amount of it. I just want to kind of just go through things. But, one... Oh, just as a aside, if people didn't know and you are familiar with Endless Space 2, if you use your middle mouse button, you actually get stats on whatever the current set of ships that are on the screen are. So, I might as well have that up while I talk. Um, so there's a problem with Endless Space 2, namely it's incomplete, but it's had patches, lots and lots of patches. It's gone through years of development. It's not incomplete that way. It's more incomplete as in it's completely unbalanced and the developers kind of just stopped patching it. So the fandom has. So what I am actually going to be doing is that I'm going to be loading a mod called Enhanced Space 2. This is a community bug, bug fix and rebalance mod. Now, for those of you that have, are aware, sorry for touching the mic, for those of you who are aware of my history with rebalance mods, is that I'm not a fan in general, but this game desperately needs it. So I've started trying to get used to it, and yes, that does mean at some point I will go back to Master of Magic and try again after I've gotten used to other rebalances. But I want to play a bit in this rebalance mod. Unfortunately, it has to restart the game in order to load the mod. Um, luckily, I have a fairly powerful machine. And yes, it is actually that stretched on my display. Hey, Boo. You want to say hi, Boo Kitty? As I kick over my volume thing? Nope, apparently not. Sorry. So, um, what I want to do is show you the game. So in Endless Space 2, as I mentioned, you have a large variety of factions. You'll notice that I have two of them just disabled. Uh, I do actually own all the DLC, but I really, really don't like these two bits of DLC. So I'm just going to ignore them. Um, the game actually has a nice way of trying to give you an idea as to what's good for a new player versus what's good player for an intermediate player, what's good for an advanced player, and it's these symbols here. So the ones that are the least drawn diamonds are regular, which is it follows most of the basic mechanics, good choice to understand systems. Then you have the next step up, which is advanced, where they have at least one weird thing, and you should definitely play the basic ones first. And then there's the really weird stuff, which is many unusual mechanics. 
and you should not play them until you know the game well. Naturally, I'm playing that. Um, the Vodiani are a very strange faction, especially for me. Um, so in 4X games, I traditionally go with a very high growth model. I expand very quickly. I expand up and out at the same time to the detriment of pretty much everything else. You can't do that with the Vodiani very well. I mean, you can mid to end game, but you can't in the beginning of the game. And that's all we're going to be playing. So, um, we're going to be playing with eight players. I am going to change the colors to make sure that they're actually visible because YouTube likes to squash colors. Um, darker red. We're going to go with a pink. Nah, that's too close to my own color. We're going to go with a purplish, a yellow is fine, and then a dark blue. There we go. Just want to make sure that they're visible for YouTube because it squashes colors and the mod adds in, pardon me, a lot of extra faction colors. Just the first three rows, I believe, or, or first four rows? Three, four, something like that. The first set of rows are what's in base game. Um, from here, you have the ability to increase and decrease the number of competitors. So, for instance, there could be a 12-player game, or it could be a two-player game. We're going to stick with eight. Uh, you have game speed. I'm going to be playing on fast for reference, just so this video doesn't take forever. Um, game difficulty. I like their little mouse over. An AI that just ignores your existence. Uh, it's like you have guns and they have sticks. It's like you have guns and they have guns. It's like you have guns and they have better guns. It's like you have guns and they have tanks. It's like you have guns and they have nuclear weapon systems that can track your biometrics. And finally, you shall not pass. Um, I typically try to play on hard or pre-mod I was playing on serious to impossible, but hard is fine. Um, pirates, I hate dealing with pi pirates and barbarians and mechanics like that. Just please stop. Um, we have different galaxy shapes. Unfortunately, I cannot do a spiral six because that requires a community pack that doesn't exist, as far as I can tell. Um, otherwise, we can go with like twin elliptical systems, which is actually one of my favorites because how cool they look. Um, ring, ovoid, just random. The only reason why I'm not doing random is that some of these systems are really bad. Though, it's only single player. You know what? We'll go with random. Um, resource abundance, which is a high chance of rich deposits, low chance of poor deposits, or the opposite. I tend to go for a more abundant game. Galaxy size, this is how big of a map you want to play on. I typically play on very large maps. And the amount of resource deposits, which I typically set to normal. Uh, there's additional settings that you can set as well. Uh, I'm just going to briefly go over the weird ones that I have set, which is... I have super weapons disabled. Super weapons, for reference, are Star Killer Base from Star Wars or the Death Star, where you permanently destroy planets and/or systems. Those are disabled because screw that noise. Also, the Academy Quest is disabled because the Academy Quest is the worst game in the West, ah, worst quest in the game. Don't at me. Just it's absolutely terrible. I hate it so much. But everything else is generally defaults. Oh, um, also, it'll make sure that factions are randomized, but being unique. So the AI won't be Voidiani, unless if they had no choice, because there's too many AI. Um, everything's high frequency for weird stuff. Uh, the age of the galaxy is random. There are a lot of constellations. Otherwise, it's fairly typical. Let's go ahead and start a game. So we are the Voidiani, and we're about to get a very short cutscene as to what that means. Except that the aspect ratio is going to be off because this game doesn't quite properly support widescreen on cutscenes and or loading screens. But if you can notice this background, yeah, you can tell that there's something a little weird about this faction. The background is, in fact, based off of who I'm playing. OK, 
Come on, game. The mod makes it take longer to load. We once had a home world, but we were poor caretakers. Had we not discovered the virtual relics, our tale would have ended there. By their grace, we were elevated, and we strive to serve their memory. Yet, in our moment of exaltation, a false prophet arose. The heretics summoned ancient demons and corrupted the faithful. But we refuse his lies and reject his accusations. We will see the heretic drown in his blasphemies. He will not break our will and bring ruin on our church. I think they do a really good job with the cutscenes. shed our mortal cloth and rise. a weird hitch uh, apologies for the low game volume i have it low so it doesn't overwhelm my voice um but that is one of two cutscenes that you would see in a game the violent rebellion of the heretic though long ago left scars that have only recently healed now as you once more look outward you hear reports of star systems full of wealth alien populations rich with essence and endless ruins to explore and venerate your faith is your north star that guides you as the responsibility of your church weighs on the shoulders of your holy cloth may the virtual saints guide you all right so a brief explanation um so as i was hi boo it's not just the opening. Boo Kitty is actually here. I only recorded the opening, I don't know, half an hour ago. Anyway, um, so, um, this is a religious faction, a very religious faction. They are the only religious faction in the game, if I remember right. Or, hmm, Hisho might be religious now that I think about it. But anyway, um, so long story short, all of that stuff that all of the yellow stuff that you see in the background yeah you can actually see my mouse mostly again i play on a high resolution um all of this stuff is what's called essence think of it as whenever they use the word essence replace the word essence with souls i am literally a bunch of souls crammed together in a cloth the armor that the character wears is considered their cloth it's a magic item effectively left over by the virtual endless um think predecessors are a um uh progenitor race there we go that's the terminology um except they didn't make us they just happened to have left over random magical artifacts and we went woo shiny so the Voidiani do not play in a normal way, and that's actually one of the reasons why I wanted to record this, is because they don't play in a way that I've seen in a 4X before, which I found really interesting and worked quite hard in trying to get better, get good, so to speak. Um, so let me go ahead and explain. Um, and keep in mind, I'm going to be explaining things assuming that people know what 4X games are, because otherwise, this would be the only screen that I would record for half an hour. So, in this game... Oh, um, first off, you get a little description right here. And basically, everything that you have seen is as much detail as you get in the game. Yeah, the only other cutscene is at the end of game. So, anyway, um, rather than settling... Oh, I should actually show you. So, first off... Um, you have what is referred to as Fidzi for your resources. Um, Fidzi is food, industry, dust, science, influence. Fidzi. Um, so everything produces Fidzi or 
some things produce no influence, but you get the idea. Every, resources are Fidzi. Um, the Vidyani also have essence on top of Fidzi. That's actually what this Ankh over here is. You'll notice that I will refer to as Ankh because it's funnier. Um, and I'm, there's a lot of hymnal music for them. I turned on back on the music for you, your benefit. Um, where was I going with this? <laughs> so, in Endless Space 2, what you end up doing is that you colonize systems. This is the Otero system. Um, you'll notice a lot of references to things, including reality, on these system names. Or Star Wars, or Star Trek, or any other sci-fi series. I've seen Foundation references. I think I've even spotted a Smack reference once. So, they're not afraid to make references on things. Anyway. Um, so, normally what you end up doing is that you have a faction. That's actually a really good start. Um, you have a faction, they settle on the planets, they live there, and they start expanding. They send colony ships out to other worlds using these star lanes, that's what these lines are, to go between systems. Vodiani work differently. Instead of colonizing planets, I colonize an arc. Arcs are intentionally referenced, biblical reference. They are ships that the uh, Vodiani people live on. And those arcs harvest planets that they happen to be bordering around. In this case, I have the technology to be able to go after both snow and forest planets. So I am harvesting the contents of each of these three planets. You'll notice that there's one little thingy here that's one population on each of these planets. When it comes to most factions, like for instance, you might have three population total and you can spread it across the planets however you see fit. I have one population. I, I utilize the resources from every planet simultaneously. So, yeah, they get a little weird. Also, Voidiani are freaking huge. Um, you can sort of see a scale in that picture on the left, or above my head, there, up there. Um, I think Voidiani, uh, if you're familiar with the anime series Attack on Titan, they're titan-sized. If you're not familiar with the anime series, think people the size of skyscrapers, and that's the Voidiani. They're not nice, by the way. I'm basically playing an evil faction. So, um, we have buildings and or units that we can build over here. Um, it follows a standard mechanic of, hey, look, this particular thing costs 80 industry. I am producing 51 industry a turn, so it will take me two turns to finish this. You have a queue. Um, the main thing is that you grow very, very slowly. Um, one of the penalties for the Voidiani is what's called the gargantuan population penalty that you can see by me mousing over the food. Um, that means that I lose 10% of my food constantly, so I grow very, very slowly. On the other hand, I have an ability known as Holy Proliferation, which is basically I can pay Ankh to increase my population. General And the cost for how much it costs is based off of how much population is in the system. Generally, it's not worth paying Ankh early on, unless you have a really wide system, as in five planet system, that you can colonize all five planets, and you have nothing else to do. Instead, you use your Ankh for arcs. This is what allows me to colonize another system. As the Voidiani, I want to colonize as fast as possible. Because I spread wide much better than I spread tall. Unfortunately, it costs 200 Ankh for me to currently build an arc. And that price will increase with the more arcs that I have. My maximum Ankh is 250, and I'm only making 10 a turn. Which means it's going to be 20 turns until I can make another arc. At least as it stands now. We're going to change that a bit, but anyway. Um, another mechanic that is a little unique to the Endless series, so both Endless Legend and Endless Space have this, is a hero mechanic. You can assign a hero to either a um, fleet, which is what I've just done. I assigned it to the scout unit over here, the wheel class. Or you can assign it as a governor. 
Um, heroes assigned as governors give bonuses to systems. Heroes assigned to fleets give bonuses to the fleet. They're referred to as generals. Um, Boidiani heroes are usually better as generals than they are as governors because they have an ability that increases the amount of damage that they do or damage that the fleet does by 5%. And their starting skill for governor is just plus 10 influence. There's no multiplier there or anything. It's just 10. And this is a skill tree. So as you your hero gains experience, they level up and you can start going down the tree. This is one of the changes that the rebalance mod made is that the skill tree, there's now lines between these. Before, all you had to do was have a certain number of ranks in an inner ring to be able to go to the next ring. In this case, you need the fewer ranks now, it's only three ranks, but you also need to have at least one point in the prerequisite skill. You can also edit the ship design, which I am going to be doing, but momentarily, because I have a few other changes they need to make. You can edit every ship design in the game. Well, every ship design that you can build in the game. It is important to specify that one because you can get units that aren't of your design. Um, what I'm doing is cramming this ship with as many modules that give me more onk as possible. So the next arc that I make will give me 30 onk a turn. Onk, 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 onk. Onk is good. And since arcs only cost Ankh and or any special resources that you use, which we'll get to that a bit later, it's not really a reason not to max them out other than very high upgrade costs. This is next to nothing in upgrade cost. I'm not too concerned about that. In fact, I'm actually going to do one science at the moment. And just upgrade this now. So now I'm getting 20 Ankh a turn. We also want to put more probe modules onto these ships. And finally, we have what's referred to as a leecher ship. Leecher ships are unique to the Vodiani. They steal people's souls from other systems. So in a colonized system, whether that's another AI or a minor faction, um, I park a leecher there and steal their souls. It drops their food and I gain essence. Told you I'm not playing a nice faction. Um, you can actually drop their food enough to start draining their population until eventually there will be no population left on the system. This is a normal end state for me. Or even mid state. Um, yeah. Okay, um, what else? Oh, so there are what's referred to as anomalies. These can be anything from a subterranean anomaly, which may have resources, to another subterranean anomaly. Apparently, I only have subterranean anomalies to start, so I'm going to go ahead and hit both. One of them has dark glitter, and one of them has dark glitter. Okay, so apparently I'm starting with dark glitter. To explain, there are various luxuries in the game, and at the moment I can only see the first tier of luxuries, but there are three tiers of luxuries, each corresponding to Fidzi plus Approval, happiness in a various system, Manpower, which is used for um, invasions and building ships, it's literally staffing a ship, and Trade Bonuses. Trade bonuses are more useful in multiplayer than they are in single player, so I'm not too concerned about that. Right now, I have Dark Glitter. I am producing a lot of Dark Glitter. I have Dark Glitter. Dark Glitter is probably one of the least useful ones. At least for the way I play. I need to check something really fast. I need Super Spuds. Okay. So, another concept that Endless Space 2 has is the idea of a population booster. You can spend luxuries to make the population more um, prone to growth shall we say? So what it does is that when your systems grow due to having enough food, the percentage chance that it will be a various population type is 
based off of how much population you currently have. It's complicated, but long story short, if you engage a population booster, it makes it a higher chance to be that population. The Voidiani are xenophobic. You only have Voidiani. This is my only population type throughout the entire game. But the secondary effect of the booster is quite nice. It doubles the amount of resources you get from population. For most populations, it's like plus one industry, or maybe even plus two influence, or something really basic like that. For the Voidiani, it's plus four dust, plus four science, plus four industry, plus four food. So everything but influence. And these plus fours get doubled. So it's vital that I get access to, in this case, Super Spuds is that resource. Um, the resource is random every game. And whether I'm nearby it or not, it's also random. Fun. Um, this is for politics. I'll cover that when we actually get to politics. We also have some laws that we can pass. I'm going to go ahead and pass the Punishment for Sins of Lesser Races command, which gives me plus 10 Ankh for every system that I have, and also plus 4 Dust per population. Which is, and it costs 2 Influence per population. I have 3 population total, so it costs 6. Uh, no, sorry, I have 1 population total. It just costs that much more when I initialize it. Anyway, <coughs> one per turn is easy, especially now that I'm getting nearly 30 essence. It's much better. All right, let's go ahead and start moving around. So what I am trying to find is a minor faction. Minor factions are AIs, but they only have one system. Um, they don't grow beyond that one system, and nobody particularly cares if you destroy them, which is fine. Oh, right. I need to do research. Research. The research tree in this game looks very different from most 4X games. It's a research circle. So you start in an inner ring, and once you have a certain number of techs in that inner ring, so the innermost one, it's one tech. Uh, here, this one, I have one tech. You can gain access to the next ring around and proceed all the way up to the outer ring. Um, the next ring's two techs, the ring after's three techs, and so on. So, right now, I have Xenobiology, which allows me to colonize snow and tundra planets, and I have Offworld Agribusiness, which gives me approval and the ability to actually talk with minor factions. That's all I start with. Now... One thing I want to look at is this is an ice world. So at some point, I'm going to want to have the technology to colonize this ice world. Doesn't need to be now, especially since that is, is it this one? This one. Yeah, it's this one. So if I went to research it right now, it would take me four turns, which is not necessarily a bad option. But instead, I could start researching, say, some of these texts to give me resources instead. That also take four turns, huh? Actually, you know what? I am going to research that next. I thought about playing this on a normal widescreen aspect ratio, but I decided I wanted to have fun. That's the whole point of Vita is that I'm trying to enjoy myself. All right, so we've discovered a system here. There's four planets in the system, and I cannot colonize a single one of them. So not great. And this is a nebula. Um, if my influence, which is what this green circle is, were to cover that nebula, I gain plus 10% money on all of my systems. And if I have a battle in that system, um, whomever wins gets plus five mon plus five dust per command point. I'll explain when I get there for each ship in that battle or each ship that survives in that battle and also extra experience. So, you know, pretty decent. Okay, I'm going to go that way. However, because I'm exploring, I gain more... I think you gain XP for exploration, but my hero leveled up. So we have these six perks as options that we can take. There are various levels of the perks. Most of these are two. This one, three, for an example. And since 
and each side has either one that's a better perk for a general and one that's better perk for a governor. Um, they'll have effects that'll be labeled as on system versus on fleet slash ship. So I have really, I'm deciding between plus 20% shield capacity or then let's just go for health because I know it's coming up very shortly. And that's it. Oh, wow. That took less time than I expected. That's going to stink. So each faction has their own quest line. Um, this is the start of the quest line for the Voidiani. It's there's a lot of lore here. I'm not going to be reading it all out loud because I don't want to talk too much, but you can read what's currently on the screen and then I'm going to scroll down momentarily. There's the rest of the lore. You can go ahead and pause from before and now. But long story short, I need to destroy pirate fleets that were just spawned. These pirate fleets will luckily stay where they're at, but they will attack everything that walks through, including the unit that's about to fly in there. I don't have a choice on this. This is my only option. My reward is Hyperium, which is one of the strategic resources. But unfortunately, that ship is about to hit it. So I told it to run away immediately without getting involved in battle. It's unfortunate because that's actually a system I can colonize. The other system's over there. Yeah. So what we're doing is that we are exploring anomalies because anomalies have cool stuff. So there's a life form there. Turns out the life form is Hadeoplagic life, which is ocean life. So if I were to settle that place, every population point would get plus three science and plus one food. It's a beneficial anomaly. Plus, I also get a little bit of money, which is always nice. Also, this particular planet has multiple moons. Um, unfortunately, multiple moons actually doesn't help all that much for me. Neither do single moons. So... Normally what happens with moons is that you get extra population slots for every anomaly with moons. The Voidiani ignore the planet when it comes to population slots. You'll notice that all three of these planets are three population, and it doesn't matter what size the planet is, what type of planet it is, it's three. I have to level up my arc in order to be able to get more population. What's called system development. So this anomaly does nothing for me. It's not bad. And there's some buildings that can use it, so it's positive-ish, but not great. On the other hand, deserted cities add science and industry. Mutated flora adds approval and food. These are all really nice things. Also, there's a tree there. Um, you'll notice that uh, Takanami is a uniquely named planet. That's because this is what's referred to as a unique planet. Get a lore dump. Basically, this is my homeworld. It's not a very good, unique planet, by the way. It's one of the worst ones. It's not the worst, but it's one of the worst. I think I can fight the pirates. We're going to find out. Oh, also, Otero finished my drone networks. It's now constructing a cerebral reality. I mean, a lot of these things are traditional 4X fair. The main difference is that, well, I'm not exploring a planet. I'm exploring a galaxy. Uh, looks like a disk galaxy. And I'm currently in the, I don't know if it's Crux or Cory in this case. I think it's Crux. The Crux constellation. It's not been fully discovered yet. Nobody currently controls it because you need at least three systems to control it. But when somebody does control it, you get plus 15% food, which is kind of nice. Okay, Leecher, you're going to go down this way instead. That's not actually a dead end, but that's okay. Okay, Otero finished that. We are going to construct an additional scout unit. Because there's nothing else for us to do right now. Right, ending turn. I definitely heard something happened. Ah, yes, we finished our research, which is good. Um, 
we are going to start researching things on the right side. So because I know that we're going to be receiving a reward of Hyperium somewhat soon, I'm going to research the ability to actually use it. It also gives us this building, which gives us money. Money is important. Uh, sorry, I refer to dust and money interchangeably. Dust is kind of like magic money. Ooh, I found a unique planet. And I'm also under attack, but I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, let's go ahead and minimize that. And we also have gained a new quest. This is what's referred to as a cooperative quest. Hence why it's labeled cooperative quest. And this starts every game with a particular set of mods that I have. This quest unlocks the ability to have behemoths, which I have enabled, which is enabled by default. What we all need to do combined is unlock 18 technologies from the military quadrant. So the military quadrant, for reference, go away, is this one up here. So 18 technologies across all eight factions over here need to be unlocked. It's not particularly hard, but the reward is not that great. Um, I can't click it away already, but let me quests, words in private. The reward is that first place gets 60 Eden influence, which is a luxury resource. Second place gets 30. Everybody else gets none. I don't need Eden influence for anything. Now, if this was super spuds, which is the resource that I desperately need right now, I would be trying to get additional technology in military. I don't particularly care about this. I just let it ride for a while. Anyway, we have a battle that's going on. And we have a few options here. We have the tactics that we want to use for the battle. Tactics, for reference, let me open up the military status screen. These are our battle tactics. We have the ability to change which cards that we have in our hand, so to speak. But it, we have a cooldown timer for how often we can change what cards we have. And these are basically the starting tactics. Um, some factions have plasma distortion instead of tech trophies for starting, but otherwise they're all the same. It's turtle, power to shields, and take trophies. Going back into the battle and going into advanced, I will show you what the differences are. So turtle, what that does is all of our ships will move toward the front. Um, anything that would be down in the below area would end up moving toward the middle. The other two move toward the front. That's what these indicators are. We don't have enough ships where we only care about the middle line anyway. In addition, our hull plating is increased by 25%. So if they are using certain types of weapons, we'll absorb more damage without taking hit point damage. Power of the shields is the opposite. We would all stay behind and we have shield absorption, which is for beam weapons. Um, and finally, there's take trophies, which is going somewhere in the middle and gaining loot, which is what we're going to end up taking. The enemy ships, you can see over on the left side, basically right there. Um, actually, let me lean over slightly. You can see their current makeup. Um, let me back out of this really fast and click on them so we can actually see it a little more easily. So they have two ships. The starting pirate fleets for the Voidiani are always like this with 39 attack power and 127 defense. Um, the 39 attack power, you'll notice that there's like a little bold line going off to the left. Left side indicates projectile weapons, right side indicates energy weapons. So they are using projectile weapons. And in addition, their accuracy is much better close up than it is far away. So we don't necessarily want to get up right next to them. So I'm going to use take trophies and you can actually watch the battle. Oh, you know what, let's go ahead and watch this battle. I am going to inevitably forget to disable that. So that's to load a little screen to launch the battle. I basically have no control other than on camera control and timers at this point. It's an auto battle. But battle at Forest versus the Rowing Fleet. Here we come in. Yeah. Impressive looking fleet. We can click the skip to action if we want. But, you know, you're getting the full experience here. So it's R3 are in the background, the other two are up in front, and now we're shooting at each other. We all have projectile weapons, so they're very similar to each other that way. Yeah, the auto camera is terrible, by the way. I'm going to switch to an overview camera. This actually lets you see the tactics going on. 
Looks like they also chose to be mid-range. Um, but this ship is losing its shields rapidly. It looks like we're focus firing. We just lost the... No, that's right. These are our ships. This is our hero. These are the enemy ships. Okay. So that's their hit points, I think. I don't remember. This gets weird. We're going to increase the battle speed. But those ships were defeated. We have a decisive victory. Our flagship did get heavily injured, though. Oh, we forgot to upgrade the flagship. Oh, it's fine. So we chose take trophies. They chose hard target, which is basically stay in the middle lane and you have extra defense against long range. Eh, but we killed them. That's the important part. And then we gained loot because we chose the take trophies. So we gained 120 dust and 40 science. Yay, science. We're going to investigate more anomalies. We found Ice 10, which is an, a neutral anomaly, where we have plus four science per population point on this world, but minus four approval. For some reason, they don't like living with Ice 10. In addition, we found more science. And the second one, we found titanium. And we get a little bit of titanium for discovering it. But if we were to colonize that world, we would end up getting titanium per turn. Pretty decent. We also discovered this world of Nair. Nair. But unfortunately, they don't have what we want, which is people. Makes I want to eat people. Oh, our hero leveled up, though. We should let them have more health. Now, mousing over this area is our score, and you will notice that we are dead last on score. That's because the game is really bad at handling score for the weird factions, especially bad for both the Voidiani and for the he show because both of them are low population factions the he show actually want to have three or fewer systems so they always end up looking far weaker than they actually are and the voidiani at the start are very low population not to mention we're playing on a higher difficulty so the ai is cheating a bit anyway we've finished researching astro finance so we can look at the tech tree and next thing we're going to research is galactic commodities. This allows us to buy things on the market. Like, for instance, the super spuds that we do so desperately need right now. It'll take us three turns to research that. That's not too bad. In addition, we unlocked a new stage, which allows us to potentially gain a new achievement. In this case, this achievement is be the first to have three unique star system improvements in your empire. Three wonders. And the reward is a new type of building. Don't know if we'll achieve it. All right, we have Murgashi, which does not have what I want. Let's hit that. The hive oh, cares a little hello, Cravers. Well, poop. Races. So we found our first AI. It's the nastiest one. So Cravers are locusts. Their shtick is where is it at? It's not actually listed here, but long story short, that they actually drain the world itself. So it depletes the world, and if the world is fully depleted, it permanently loses 50% of its resources. There are ways to recover a depleted world, but they're few and far between, and the Voidiani have none of them. So, if it gets fully depleted, the worlds suck. On the other hand, if it's one point away from being depleted, we're fine. So, my usual strategy as the Voidiani dealing with Cravers is to eliminate all of their population. And or have an early war. I heard that they went there, which means they're probably on the other side of this. Let's find out. 
Oh, I found a minor faction. That's nice. So we found the amoeba. Indirect descendants of a group of concrete endless, the amoeba devolved to primitive protoplasmic life forms, lost all their prior knowledge before re-evolving into a unique species with the special relationship to dust. Blessed or cursed with the ability to detach their consciousness from their physical form and create group gestalts, the amoeba developed a strong ecological mindset, always striving for harmony and balance. Their goal is to travel, meet, and learn through relatively defenseless, though their relatively defenseless natural form has bred them the need to master their physical environment. So, minor factions, you have the ability to accompany them into your empire. When you do, you gain their traits and presumably population points. As the Voidiani, I can't have other populations, so I can never actually fully integrate them into my empire, but I can still get their traits by brainwashing them. Their trait in this case is that they gain 10% food so 10% of your industry gets also added to food, which is extremely nice. So I'm going to try to keep myself being friends with them rather than trying to drain them dry. How many turns do you have until you have five turns? Okay. What I'm probably going to end up doing is draining this system, but I also want to see where the cravers are. Um, warp lanes are a one, or it takes all of your movement points, usually, there's an exception, to go from one side to the other. But you can have one movement point left and go all the way to the other side. Kind of nice that way. Okay. Um, did that, did that. Next turn. I have been recording for 46 minutes, and we are still at the very early part of the game. All right, so our relationship has improved with the amoeba because they're very happy to meet people. So they start with a large amount of approval. We are now cordial with them. So we get a little bit of resources from them, and they will let us repair and or retrofit our ships within their system, which is quite nice. So for instance, I could upgrade this leecher. I don't have a reason to. The leecher is pretty awesome as it is, and I'm not going to need to for a long time, but it could. Let's go ahead and move them down. Aha! We have found the homeworld of Butcher. Oops. Which is the name of the Craver deity. So, their homeworld is the one that's the worst in the game. It's called Husk. Effectively, the Cravers are a bioengineered weapon from the Endless, our progenitors. And they're a little too powerful, so the Endless just shoved them on a random world and nuked it. That's why you see impact craters everywhere. Um, they effectively survived going all the way back to the Stone Age and coming back. Cool. Drain. Um, let's go ahead and look. So we've got Lava World, an Ash World, Husk, which counts as a Jungle World, but it's already depleted, and an Ocean World. Oh, they did actually end up colonizing a second world. That stinks. Although they don't have any population on it. That's weird. So yeah, Husk starts depleted. So the game's trying to, in, or at least in regular, the mod it might not. So what I've done is that I started leeching Husk. So Husk loses a little bit of its growth, which will slow them down. And I gain Ankh. In fact, I'm actually gaining more Ankh from that one leecher leeching a system than I was gaining per turn before why it's important to build leechers. Um, we're going to do shields. Uh, that unit currently doesn't have any shields, but that's fine. And then we want you to come back. Oh, right. I have to wait until it actually Tell finishes. Us. Tell All right, so, plan. needless to say, AIs don't like it when you steal their soul. Um, however, I just don't care. So I'm telling them Tell to us. go screw themselves. Tell us what you plan. As a result, because I've given them a negative response, they have a couple of options, and they've chosen 
minus 10 happiness and plus 10 percent science for the next five turns it's not the worst but Ooh. um that's hospitable we found dust ruins which give money nice I'm checking to see what types of curiosities there are to see if there's anything that I want. Just on dummy, I should probably be mirror imaged that way I'm actually looking in the correct direction. <laughs> that's to my right, that's to my left. <sighs> They're all atmospheric, which, oh, there's a life form. Life form's not bad. Neither are ruins, let's go with ruins. Eh, just money. Alright, how many turns will it take you to get there? Seven. They're already going to be there at that point. We're going to queue up some leechers because we're going to need to make sure that they don't expand any further. They've already finished. Cool. So, we have built a new unit. Um, that unit is in space dock, and we can create a fleet from it, which we're going to. Um, in that case, I'm actually going to want you to head home. And basically, I'm going to be pissing off the Gravers for as long as they survive. Because they decided to colonize in my constellation. So, screw them. Also, we now have enough Ankh to make an Ark. So we immediately do so, shoving it out. Oh, hold on. I forgot I messed around with the arcs. I'm going to change my arc to be all dust or all onk all the time instead of science. I tend to prioritize growth early on. And we also need some shields. You can design your ships pretty much how you want. This early on, there's not too many options, but okay. Now we're building an arc. Arcs will always complete in one turn, unless if you have some really weird requirement on the arc. And that will be that. I will probably be bringing the arc toward Delphinius, because for Voidiani, you usually want to go high popula high number of systems. Um, Nair is going to be one that I will keep... Oh, sorry, Boo. Boo's at my feet. Um, I'll keep Nair behind and colonize it later because it does have a unique system. Let's take a look at it. So there's a lava, savanna, a monsoon world, which is nice, and Tor, which is the unique planet. Um, Tor, for reference, gains a huge bonus to influence in dust, which is very nice, but there's a quest that will trigger automatically at some point that requires us to colonize another unique planet. So I want to keep that open if I can. I would normally like to have colonized Hekka, but it's a little Hekka late for that. Grumble. I will drive them from that world. Although, I think I might need to get some ships. So the Empire Development Quadrant is where ships come in. Efficient shielding in this mod grants you two new hull types, the Sluam class and the Toysam class. The Sluam class is a small attacking ship, and the Tulsam class is a small protector ship. We need ships because I'm going to be at an early war with the freaking Cravers. We have our Ark. Our Ark is going to go toward Delphinius. So, one of the concepts in this game is politics. Um, various factions will have different political systems. In my case, I believe I'm a republic, I want to say. Let me double check that really fast. I'm a federation. So, what that means is that there can be multiple political parties in office at the same time. And we have elections every certain number of turns. In this case, in the next election, it's currently looking like the religious faction will end up winning, with second going to the scientists. 
this is just chance of happening. It's not guaranteed. So just keep that in mind. I have been screwed over by this many times. All right. We're only doing a handful of turns, by the way. Um, probably play to about an hour, so another five minutes. Our purpose is to kill. Oh, hey, look, they're taunting me. You, though, Who would have thought? Will suffer they're upset because I didn't get any well. tribute from me. And they're stronger than me. And that's it. Cravers are dicks. So are the Voidiani, though. Oh, hey, look, I have another leecher. Shame that this is going to end up going straight to Hecka and start draining you of your souls. Your soul is forfeit. Let's go ahead and scout out the Nair system. See if we can remove some more hair. All right, so we found a strong magnetic field, which is detrimental anomaly. This gives minus two science and minus two industry. Most factions later on in the game will have ways of mitigating anomalies and or even reversing them to become positive. We don't. So that sucks. And then we also found some Hyperium, which is nice. And we have a new quest. One of your exploratory drones used by your team for rapid planetary assessment has disappeared. According to your lead technician, this type of drone has a particularly low malfunction rate. He thinks it was intentionally sent off course by someone or something. The drone has a cargo bay for collecting samples. Perhaps if you'll find it, you'll discover what happened to it. Two sites look like promising leads, and they're both in difficult positions though, and recovery will be expensive and possibly dangerous. So we need to explore the two quest curiosities on Nair 2. Each expedition will cost us five titanium, which since we're not producing titanium, not great, but the reward is that we get a ship. It's a pirate ship, it's not a ship that we can upgrade, but hey look, we're gonna be at war somewhat soon. That's not necessarily a bad idea to have. All right, it's election time. So we have three options for elections. We can do official support, which is giving a small bonus to one political party. We can intimidate citizens, a strong penalty for one political party, although we can't afford any of the other stuff, or reinforced intimidation, which is a strong boost to a selected political party. So basically we can go, hey, look, you really want the religious faction and party, or in, power or you really don't want to vote for religious I don't care what else I'm gonna vote for the ecologists they are now the secondary faction which is fine that's not exactly what I wanted but it's not bad and the religious faction has become an established political party which means we've unlocked a new law the ability to get plus two experience per turn on all of our ships plus 25 percent experience on all of our heroes and plus 15 percent fids it's missing the influence so it's fids instead of fidzy per hero on system so per governor we don't have any governors right now this is not useful for us at the moment but later on it will be and as long as the religious faction is at least one of the factions in power, we have the ability to use it. That law, that is. All right, we have researched our hulls. Oops. Uh, all right, this is the quest line that I was referring to where we're gonna want, uh, the second stage of this quest requires us to settle a unique planet. So our options, uh, so an emissary from the academy arrives dressed formally. They only agree to speak or communicate in public venues while being recorded. It's no ordinary discussion. It appears that the head of the academy is indisposed, and various organizations within the academy are beginning to operate with a certain degree of independence. You're provided with a few names, a list, a small explanation, really a marketing brochure, on the academy's structures and organization. Once the discussions are over, you place an encrypted call to the hero in your employ, who is visibly uncomfortable. You understand, they say. We are beings of exceptional power. We're trying to seek only strength and knowledge, but... Some seek more. You finish. Yes. There are associations, fraternities within the Academy, theoretically just clubs for heroes with shared interests. Those who seek power often use them for leverage, however. In research, training, exploration... None of this is shocking, though it does make you uneasy. But as long as they lack access to resources, you say, they're not a threat, at least not to friendly empires. 
Your employee nods as if agreeing and prepares to end the discussion. Then, at the last second, changes their mind. They add, "Remember that there are unclaimed pieces of enormous or places of enormous wealth out there, and everyone's starting to look at them." The transmission is terminated, leaving you curious and concerned. So, heroes come from the academy. They have been enhanced with dust. Um, to give a reference, Final Fantasy VII Mako injections, it's kind of like that. They have experience with dust going directly into the blood system, and they become really weird. And or magical. So, we can either start getting information, where we can seek information about these possible unclaimed places in the galaxy, or we can seek the unclaimed places that our hero spoke of by just searching for them. Um, we get different rewards, and for some quest lines, these actually start branching out. There's actually a third one, but this requires a unique constellation, which we don't have. Um, I have never been able to get this to happen, so I don't know what actually triggers it. So either we can explore 10 curiosities, or we can explore four systems outside of our constellation. We're going to go with this one, but the reason why is for the reward. This one gives us a probe microfactory. Probes are how we're using to scout out curiosities. This will drop the cooldown time to zero. So basically, it, you respawn probes every turn, but it's a module, which you could just fill with a probe instead. So it's not great. The other option is just finding four systems outside of your constellation, which sounds much better to me. Also, the reward gives you a movement bonus thing, which we need. We can use faster movement. I know we're past an hour. We're at an hour at this point. All right. Also, we had an event that happened where a distant stellar giant about 80 times the size of an average star just went supernova. Capitalizing on the immediate attention drawn by the event, a pacifist group within your empire has launched a campaign to bring home the fleets that are monitoring the event rather than leave them on patrol. So our effects are that we get plus 20 influence on all of our systems. Nice. Plus 10% dust upkeep on our empire, which not great, but we also don't have too many buildings, so it's not that big of a deal. And pacifists have grown in power. These random events just happen. We're going to move everybody around. We're going to drain all of your souls. You have yet another colony ship. Uh, oh yeah, and we finished tech. Um, what resource are we going to have first? We're going to have Hyperium first. So I am going to research Baryonic Shielding. This will give us a Hyperium engine, which is faster movement, but it costs us Hyperium to use in our ships, and also Hyperion probes, which gives us better probes and movement in our scout ships, which is what we have right now. I know that a lot of these terms are going to be completely foreign to people. If you're still watching, wow. Um, and let me know if you want me to continue. I honestly don't know if people do want me to continue or not. This isn't exactly a subject people like all that much. So yeah, um, I'm just going to finish up into my arc landing in Delphinius, basically. And naturally, I'm pissing off the Gravers more. Oh, right. I forgot to start giving, start praising. So now I'm going to get plus two influence over the civilization a turn. When it reaches 100 influence, it's 50 outside of the mod. With the mod, it's 100. I can start doing quests for them or even just throw enough influence into their face where they just love me and wear all my blue jeans. All right, let's actually upgrade our hero ship really fast. It's not much to upgrade. It's just adding a shield, but, you know, helpful. It also heals them. And what we're going to want to do is send the hero ship over to where things are going to happen. Also, we have a new leecher. That's going to Hecka. Make them have heck of growth penalty. Otera's finished, though. So we can now build sustainable farms, which give us food. Ooh, our population even increased. This is a very high food place. That makes sense. Meow. Meow. Aww. 
you can almost see her on camera. Um, we can build Xenotourism, which give us money and even more money for any luxury deposits, of which we have two, so that's not bad. We can build Happiness Improvement. We're currently at 80% happiness. 85, I think, is the next tier up. So it's not a bad idea either. Or even more money. But this one is primarily on Dry Worlds. We don't have any Dry Worlds, do we? Nope. So this would just end up being plus two money per population and buyout reduction, which we can't even buy anything. And it costs Hyperium. So this one would be far better for us to get money. Also get some food. Although, actually, I want to build a ship in the middle. Right, we have finished our attack. Soon your worlds ah. will be scoured wasteland. So they're spamming me at this point to try to get more influence over me. So I'm going to end up doing the exact same thing right back to them. But unfortunately, it'll cost me more than it did them. I should have done that first. Also, we have explored enough in the science and exploration quadrant to get more stuff. So now we can explore higher level curiosities. We have free movement, which allows us to move without warplanes, although very, very slowly. And we get the next tier of curiosities, or next tier of luxuries to scout. Can we even from Berkeley are back? Coming. No, we don't have anywhere near enough influence. Great. So what ends up happening is that their borders are going to start taking over mine. And if our borders start overlapping the system themselves, bad things can happen. So not great to have happen. Also, our arc finally arrived. So we're going to park our arc. And we now have Delphinius. Mm -hmm park the Ark. We're going to leech even more food. Um, I don't know if they're even getting pop positive food output at this point. It's really hard to tell. Um, so they're getting plus 25 food. They're eating a certain amount of food. And we are doing a... 5, 10, 15, uh, 15 food penalty for each one. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they're losing 5 food a turn right now. Or more. So, this will start shrinking. And they colonize. You bastards. Nope. That's going there now. I cannot let them keep Nair. <sighs> Cravers. Anyway. This was a brief introduction to Endless Space 2. Hope you've enjoyed this internet, and I'll talk to you next time.